Good morning, good afternoon, and for some of you, good evening, and welcome to the latest in a series of AGI of Sustainability webinars for 2021. My name is Eric Lynch, and I'm the CEO of the Asian Golf Industry Federation, also known as the AGIF. The AGIF holds frequent webinars and seminars where we deliver education, insights, and intelligence on turf and club management with industry leaders. Our mission is to supply career and industry building information to professionals in Asia and the rest of the world. We have a great lineup of speakers generously willing to share their time and expertise with us. In this session, we are especially fortunate to have Sir Nick Faldo to share his design philosophy in a recorded interview at his home between commentating duties on the PGA Tour. Following this interview, Mr. Mark Adams of Faldo Design and Mr. Adam Calver of Laguna Langco Resort, a Sir Nick Faldo signature design employee, Vietnam, will be on the call for a live Q&A on Sir Nick's international design activities. You can ask any questions on the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. On to the good stuff. Our Chief Communication Officer, Spencer Robinson, sat down with Sir Nick and conducted this wide-ranging interview. Please enjoy. Welcome to the latest edition of the AGIS Sustainability Series. We're honored to have with us six-time major champion, Ryder Cup hero, and famed TV golf commentator, Sir Nick Faldo. Welcome, Sir Nick. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure, pleasure. We're, uh, we're going to discuss about your golf course design and your, your second career after your six majors. <laughs> What was it that initially attracted you to the idea of golf course design and who and which courses would you say were the biggest influences on your initial design career? Well, you know, the funny thing is I started it when even when I was at Wellington City, I because it was, you know, it's a basic parkland golf course. And I remember just taking a full scat piece of paper and doing a, my own routing around the golf course. And, in, and adding bunkers and things, what I thought. And I mean, I, and I actually presented it to the club and they went, what's that? I said, well, it's a bunker, isn't it? You know? <laughs> so it was really basic. And I, so, um, because it didn't have a lot and may have been advantageous because that's when I kind of learned how to visualize things that weren't there. Like, you know, I, I remember playing the 11th hole, which was pretty basic. And I'd have to say, well, there's water in front. I pretend there's a pond in front of the green and there's the green. And then we had out of bounds on the road behind it. So to make things more difficult to, to kind of up the intensity. So um, did all that. Um, so then it would have progressed, um, you know, like many, you know, IMG um, had a design company and, you know, we had named players and, but I would at least do more than being 30,000 feet up. You know, I wouldn't just cart around the court, walk the course and say, that's fine. I actually wanted to add my input. And so you start working on greens and a bit of strategy. And you know, I don't like that. You know, you can say, can I move this? And can we, you know, and I was obviously very, and it's obviously quite a skill, you know, I wouldn't know, but very early on walking with Steve Smyers, you know, at Chart Hills, which is, being brought back to life now, which is great, you know, to be able to look at mud and go, oh yeah, I can see a golf hole, it takes a bit of skill because most people will just see mud, you know? <laughs> so um, you go, oh, I get it, I can see that. And then how can I, so that's all very important. And then, you know, it was, you know, fortunately in Britain, you know, God, it was a real treat to go and play Sunningdale. That was my first big treat uh, as an amateur. Uh, you know, at Moore Park, that was a that was a cult, wasn't it? But but obviously Sunningdale was the better one. And then comes the next treat. I think I went to Royal St George's with with, with um, junior with Colt, you know, County Colts team to go plan down and play Sandwich. Uh, you know, Princes. Oh, he played Princes, and then Royal St George's. Yeah. So that wow. And so, gosh. And then my next big one would have been um, uh, Lytham St. Aunt. You know, when I went to Lytham to, and I won the English Amateur at Lytham, you know, and that was the first, to go on greens, like, which are, wow, you know, I've just got to get this, I didn't miss, and so 15 feet. I mean, it was like, the greens were so perfect. 
<laughs> being actually driven nuts. As if I have 15 feet, I said, I might as well give it, give him the bloody pay. You know? <laughs> so, um, so you, you, you progress very slowly. Come on, we didn't travel much. You know, next you went to South Africa. I mean, so next first flight was to go to Dublin to play Port Marnock. So boy, did I learn slowly. And so once you then get, get on tour and you went to Australia, we went to, went to South Africa first. Um, yeah, and in Britain, we played some of the old you know, tournaments had, like I won the PGA at Birkdale. And, and we were on some really old school golf courses in those days. It was before. Um, so, you know, those, that's how I got. And then you travel to Australia and you get to see some, some Mackenzie's, obviously you go to Melbourne. Now, I guess you have just a good photographic memory of what you've seen and what you like. And so once you then start design work, so as I said, I did, I did a bit of work, you know, being a named art, name designer with IMG. And then I then started my own company, Bowder Design in Glitchy Jam 1 2000, had my own architects in London. And, you know, that, that started off well. I think we opened like five courses in 2007. And then of course in 2008, wallop, the, the big crash came and that lasted 10 years in the design business, it really did. And so we are only just enjoying really coming out of it these last couple of years where things are really picked up for, for the company. And, uh, you know, it's good. We've got a lot going on right now, which is, and, um, but I'm still busy. Um, you know, television, you know, then I change obviously in TV career. So I have to schedule kind of seasons in the year. March is a, a month off in television. So I could run to Asia and November, that sort of thing. So um, that's how we, that's how we do it. But now of course we can be in close contact with our architects, Zoom calls, that sort of thing. Plans can come backwards and forwards. I can sit and, and, um, draw my strategies and what have you and give them ideas. I see, you know, if I see pictures, the things we like, I send them photographs. I say, well, this is cool. And so we're constantly, and we, and we're constantly kind of, um, I'm in it, but obviously we've been in it from a distance again, this, this, this last year. Yeah. So it's amazing since you formed Faldo Design, I think you've created unique courses on five continents in 20 different countries, I added up. And yeah. you, you've always seemed to relish taking a hands-on approach and making yeah. visits and directing the progress yeah. of firms design projects around the world. Absolutely. Well, I enjoy it. I mean, genuinely enjoy it. I mean, it's... Um... You know, as I said, now I, I work right from the start. I mean, it, generally we send the architects in and they, they find a, a, a routing and what have you. And we discuss that. We can discuss that from afar. But then once we make decisions, I like to get in there quite early. If we get a chance, I get in to see, to be inspired by what's there. And we, we, we're very keen on that. We try, you know, golf course, boy, a golf course is a golf course. You can put the, the same in. Um, so we like to be inspired and really take a, a lead from the environment around us and the history. You know, that's what we've been doing, obviously, a lot in Asia, in, you know, in Cambodia, with our Watts and our Buddha temples and, and whatever, a shape of lakes and that sort of thing. Same in the Pakistan, when, you know, it's a country to think, wow, I never thought I'd be going to Pakistan to build a golf course, but you get inspired there from there. Uh, their history and we and we're trying to do different things off the visually visually enjoyable things going on and you know that's kind of the, been the theme that can you find a golf course with a few different um, environments to visually look and feel you know, you'll feel it in your feet as well you see it um, so yeah we're enjoying doing a little bit more art we'd be you know my architects are you know, we, we, we want to call it something like land art. You know, it's, it's fun to create some, and we've got some more great ideas. And, and um, you know, I want, I'd like to do something where I just do bend the curve a bit more, you know, the norm, just do something that people go, wow, okay, that is different. I mean, it's quite difficult, but a couple of opportunities to do that. 
And um, so I'm going to take it. I, I think just putting in a good old 18 holes, yes, we can do that. But to do something with a bit more art and uh, form to it would be would be fun. Yeah, Cambodia is an amazing example. And as you say, I think a fundamental principle of the Faldo design philosophy to draw on the local identity yeah. of each place. Yeah. Um, and I think, well, it was the Anchor Golf Resort was your first one there, which is right next door to the Anchor Wat and uh, the yeah. recent one yeah. at the Tanaj, where again, there's some amazing uh, artifacts on the golf course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, yes, that's, yeah, lots to do with your chairman, your owner, what they want to do. But um, yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing um, Cambodia again. I mean, that because we went full on, um, you know, even designing in, you, you know, you know you, we, saw, we saw a photograph of a crumbled down temple. That was our inspiration, all the steps and all the ruggedness of it. And that thought, wow, that's a very cool look. So we built that in. So and they were, you know, they gave us the brief. They wanted a, it to be the tournament course. So why not make the spectator to mountings have steps and that sort of thing? So, um, yeah, um, I'll go that way. And I want to go completely the other way where it's just going to be all beautiful curves and rolling and that sort of thing uh, where it, it may suit. So, yeah, I think it's, it's important that you do something a little more than than just throwing in teas and greens and bunkers in the right places. And, and Vietnam obviously also holds a special place in your heart, I guess, especially at Lanco, your first yeah. the Nick Faldo signature design. Yeah. Um, and again, you've always said that it's your objective to create courses that respect and sit in harmony with the natural yeah. environment. Is Lanco a perfect example of that? It's an, it's an excellent example because, you know, when we, before we started it, there was suddenly this buzz about can you create different environments? And that one is special because, you know, we, the way I describe and I tell people, well, we start through the rice fields and then we go through a bit of jungle and then we come up with a lovely old bit of an old sand dune and then we head along the beach and then we're down the river and then we're in the rocks back in the jungle and then we did the, the blowout bunkers for a, a mile of sand. So, Hey, every single hole is very, it's important to have memorability because, you know, even the great, some great golf courses is bunker left, bunker right. What about the fourth, third hole? Bunker left, bunker. What about that? So you can't, there's no real definition. So it's kind of nice when I like to do that when people can say, oh, you know, I birdied the 14th hole and that's the one that goes this way and that way. It's got a big rock here. And a, hey, they remember it. It's not just bunker left, bunker right, you know. So, um, that's a great one, and obviously I've enjoyed that because that was that was really that really was a true hands-on. Um, they we walked the course um, just after the usual, you know. Remember they have the rainy season, so they they cut a sway there, you know, eight ten foot through through the jungle and some, so we could see what we're looking at, and. Um, so that was, we were doing our Indiana Jones stuff. You know, we chopped a tree down and that was the bridge across to the 10th tee. Um, so when you're walking in jungle, it's, you know, we walked, we walked, we came through the valley and walked straight on the golf course and it was sopping wet. And it, cause it's, it's sopping wet coming this way with humidity and the waters, it's so, so that, oh, that was hilarious. We, we have some great fun times like we, and we'd walked all the way out and we'd arranged to have lunch at the other end of the golf course on the beach so we've walked jungle a couple of miles of jungle to get out and they decided to, to they they got the local indian restaurant to supply us with lunch on the beach and so we get there and they've got their sign up and everything they're cooking away I think this is great and because we then go sure we've got nowhere to sit i mean we've got got to eat and just do we sit on the sand which wasn't you know it's was all hot and humid and wet and everything so somebody said, we'll go and get chairs. Well, the chairs, of course, were um, two miles that way. So, of course, by the time the chairs arrived, we'd already finished eating. Of course, a silly little things you remember. But, you know, you you felt a million miles out. When you went, quite a lot of projects, you could go and walk it, and you'd absolutely get lost. Where the hell are we? And where are we going? So it's, um, but I enjoyed that, because you, then you're going in and finding, you're finding holes, and you're saying, oh, found something. Don't touch it. Yeah. We did that. We 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 were in uh, where were we were in Kansas, 
uh, we were in Kansas, uh, in the sand hills of Kansas, and we found the most beautiful par three, natural, just this pop up of sand. It's gonna, it's gonna be a little tickle, 120 yard thing coming in from everywhere. Oh, it's perfect. It? And the bulldozer guy didn't understand that how perfect that was because it was humpy and bumpy and he went, yeah. and that was gone gone forever so we let you learn a lesson like if you find something put, put tape around it do not touch this because you know if you don't understand it looked crazy like how yeah probably couldn't see it we could see this beautiful pop-up you know green and no the, the bulldozer guy couldn't see it no oh, that needs a bit of flattening up so that was gone forever so hey so that's why it's fun to find greens and in the road in the woods on a ledge of a you know, you find all these drop-offs and then they could they come alive. So um, you can tell I enjoy it. I mean, I'm one of those guys that luckily very strong visually and I paint pictures with my hands, same as this golf course. So uh, that's that's why I enjoy it. And uh, in, in terms of being a sustainable golf course, there can be few clubs around the world that are able to match Laguna Lanco with its yeah. rice paddies and water buffalo. How, yeah. how conscious were, were you of all of that during the design process? Very much so. You know, we, um, you know, that's again, that's down to um, the mission that, uh, that Lanco had and they wanted to create something special and you know golf courses has has had a bad rap for a long time hasn't it you know, they, people don't appreciate how green they are i really don't appreciate they think you know and that stopped a long time ago you know the science in um look uh, maintaining and manicuring a golf course naturally is a real science and they and it, it's been well and truly mastered but the but probably the perceptions of yeah, as I said, I had a bad rap. I hope things things are better now. Uh, but they, you know, they did a great job in um, in all the things that they, you know, the emissions onto the golf course, the uh, you know the uh, the energy used, the water waste, that sort of thing, and and then the you know and the social impact as well is important. You know, the the rice, the paddy fields to to bring them back to to life. And you know the, the hotel uses twenty percent of the rice, and eighty percent goes to the villages. Hey, little things like that. Um, putting the putting the the buffalo on the little family of buffalo, so uh, which weren't very um, cooperative when I tried to do a photo <laughs> shoot with them. But uh, yeah, it's it's a good spot. I mean, it's, it it sends a very good message of. Uh, how to create the most out of a make a natural environment very usable and very sustainable. And it's, it's been a great host venue for the Faldo Series Asia Grand mm. Final for the last few years. I know, I think last time you were there, you added a 19th hole, and every yeah. time you go there, you seem to do little tweaks and add, adding new angles yeah. and approach. Yeah, exactly. Well, the best thing that we did was, you know, the the, the clearing program had started a long time ago. You know, you know I, I designed that course and I went back because I, I enjoyed it. I said, hey, this is, a, this is a great spot in the world to go and visit. Uh, the food's great, the hospitality's great, the spa's great. So I started going back and, you know, it, and it was quite a mission you know, to maintain jungle because, uh, you know, the joke always is, well, if you cut it back too much and wait five minutes and it's grown back. And it's literally, you know, they were chipping away at it. And it, and it wasn't until Adam came along and, and we really understood, let's blitz this, get some oxygen in there. That was the most, you know, once people then say, oh, golf courses need oxygen. So um, that was major. So we started, uh, you know, beautifying the jungle, manicuring the jungle and getting some air in there. And it's, you know, it's really come alive. And it was, you know, it was very penal, you know, golf course, I always said, you know, outside the cart path line, I'm sorry, it has to be, has to be jungle, but inside the cart path line for, for his resort courses should be playable. So we, we had to do a lot of work there to make it playable. And I think we've got a good balance now. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a, all of that put together makes it a really special, very special spot. 
Fabulous. We've had a couple of questions come in from uh, Asian Golf Industry Federation members that are interesting. Um, one, as a course designer, you've sculpted golf courses in many different climates. Do you get yeah. involved in the agronomic discussions related to turf grasses? And is it a subject that interests you? I, to be honest, I, I don't get heavily involved in that. It's, you know, it's those are for real, the experts. And obviously you take a lot of advice locally as well, because some people say that that just doesn't work here. Um, and you can't come bowling in with a, really with a textbook in, in some places in the world. It, you've got to go with the local feel. You know, and we've, we've obviously now, we're lucky we're back at the trend of getting hard and fast golf courses going again, um, trying to create that character um that style of play um which we enjoy most i think because it uh, adds so much more around the greens rather than the ball just plug in sticking three feet off a green if it goes off wandering and it leaves you all sorts of different chipping options is important but no i generally you know obviously every tournament every golf course has its team and um you know we take advice from the experts on what's so, you know, there's a brief of how it wants to play, obviously. And then you, you suit the best grasses to, obviously, temperature, water, terrain, sunlight. You know, it, all those things get put in the mix and, they, and everybody agrees on what we, uh, what's best for the golf course. Uh, another question that came in every week we see you on television at the uh, PGA tour venues, beautiful greenery, immaculately mm. manicured fairways, green speeds well in excess of 10 on the spin stint meter. Oh. That, does that promote unreal unrealistic expectations among club golfers yeah. as to how yeah. their home courses should be presented? Well, yeah, obviously it's very expensive, you know, and this, you're right, this has become a, I'm, I'm in awe many weeks of how fantastic the condition, I mean, as I describe on TV, I say, you know, wall to wall, unbelievable, magnificent rough, you know, <laughs> which basically four inches from the edge of the fairway to the, you know, not a, there's not a blemish, there's not a weed out there, nothing. I mean, it's, you know, the growth is consistent. Some of them are, you know, Lucky golfers, their, their presentation they get is, again, amazing. You know, we were talking about our early days, you know, coming on tour in the 80s. They said, take it or leave it, mate. You know, you're hitting balls off sand and it's blown out and rough and gnarly lies. Well, that was all part of learning golf. Um, now, they can, you know, you, you, you demand perfect, perfect of everything and they create it, which is amazing. So, yes, it's, um, I'm sure the average golf club it can be a huge expense. Um, we were all trying to, we were trying to be involved in a, but I'm also, well, we were trying to be involved in a project where it was going to be literally au naturel. The sheep were maintaining the, the fairways. And I said, this is wonderful because it's natural. And I'm, you know, I'm again, I'm a, I was wanted to do a links where you would say, Hey, we walk, we water the teas and water the greens to keep them alive. And that's it. What happens in between is natural. If it hasn't rained for six weeks, it's rock hard. If it's chucked it down, well, obviously it's green. And um, I'm a big fan of that as well. Um, so, and I think a lot of people are now as well. I think it, they are they're happier. I think fortunately the days of, God, I remember, you know, the long com used to be played in late September. So it's already European rain. And if the greens weren't bottle, bottle green, they'd paint the greens. <laughs> if it was one, if it was, if it was what, two shades off bottle green, they were out with the paint. So it was like, that's what they thought golf had to be. It had to be super green. And we all know we, we actually like uh, burnt biscuit color now as well on, on golf courses. Well, one of the hottest topics in golf right now, obviously, is Bryson DeChambeau and the prodigious distance that he's yeah. going to go for. Well, uh, I guess as a course designer, how, how does that challenge you when you start? Yeah. How on earth do you Bryson-proof a course <laughs> and prevent <laughs> no, you... courses from becoming well, obvious? Well, this, this is the problem. You know, quite often you... You know, your, your early brief on your the project is, oh, we, we want a club course and we, and we want this to people to enjoy. And then, and then suddenly small, oh, we want a tournament to come here. <laughs> you know, well, 
these the turning point mo you know this has been a gone going thing for the last 10 years with my architects when i say when i say what's the turning point you know it's 260 yards and there's 280 and then it's 300 now and i said well if it's if there's any help if it's downwind or any slope downhill slope we're now at 320 350 and he's like so how do you if you want to create this is the, the major problem so if you want to create like I say, if I want to create a hole where good old days was just driving a three iron, par four, um, because you know people don't realize a good driver for Simon was was two sixty, and a three iron went just over two hundred yards. So there's your four sixty, you know, four seventy, four eighty, four eighty was huge in that, wasn't it? That was your driving three iron par four. So. Now, if you want to give them a drive, and the drive's going minimum 320, and they can actually, a lot of them can hit the blimmin' four and three irons, 240 through the air. Unbelievable. Add that up. So that's completely different if you want to give them that. But that's, so we have such a, it's the problem is we, the pros are so darn good compared to the club golfer um, and the pro is chalk and cheese now, isn't it? So you can't compare the two. So, and then the other, what is this? Is a, this is a long. So, if you want to build a professional golf course, yes, and you want to challenge them on length to give them a drive and a three iron, well, yes, you're you're eight thousand yards with, if there's an eight, if there's a bit of help in the fairway. And so, there are people are now screaming at we can't do that. Um, you know, I we're all looking at it. To, it's a tough one, so because we love what Bryson's doing, he's trying to drive a par five, which I, you know, how much, how much fun is that? You know, and they're, and they're all driving, trying to, even the 10th at Riviera, it was now a three wood for these guys to get it up, you know, 280 to 300, get it front corner. It's still a, it's a great shot. It's, it's a very demanding shot. In the old days, we couldn't do that. Nobody could get to that green at 310. We went three iron left and wedged it. So, you know, so you can tell some people it's, it's the way of everything. Everything wants bigger and faster, don't they? Of, um, so golf is is gone that way. That, but we the problem, of course, we have is we have fantastic old great golf course, which is at seven thousand yards. So you, when you had a beautiful hole that was four hundred and ten yards, these guys don't have a crack at it now. Got that rocket mortgage that we played last two. Well, it was last year when we came back. There was par fours where there having a go for it and hitting it front edge just and it's like that is not the way that strategy that this whole yeah you know, and it used to be i played with jamie sadowski um i played a lovely opening hole three with an eight and he hits it front edge <laughs> it's just off the green driving the chip and i go well that's not how where we see it so um the now the science he can't not, he cannot not Bryson because he's gone, hang on a minute, who said golfers can't train? Well, we're all told, oh, can't train like a long driving champion because you're going to ruin your touch. So if he's found a way to train like a long, long driving champion and he maintain his touch, ha, good on him. You know, so he's now built his body where, as you can see, he's, he's number one in par fives and number one in par threes. So, um, and well, that week he won at Rocket, he was number one in driver and number one in putting. So how about that? Be somebody like that. So anyway, um, as you can tell, there's so many different what things to, to, to talk about with this. You know, it's I I really do get it's a, such a shame that the guys cut down a fabulous old golf course that used to be a, as I said used to be a three wood and a five iron, and then they go whoosh, and they got ninety yard lob wedges in, and you're like. That's not the way this hole was designed, or you know, in, I look, and it almost makes it sound embarrassing. Embarrassing is a word. It was like, you know, I think people are getting fed up as keep saying, "Oh, old school." You know, I've hit we've hit famous iron shots from five iron, Muirfield at the fifteenth hole. You know, last time we played Muirfield, it was we were driving in front of the bunker, and we're hitting the trying to work out how to play a sixty-yard pitch and run. And I've hit, been hitting famous five irons in. So, you know, you can see it's, it, so I get both sides. I want to, bring, bottom line, I want to bring back skill. I keep promoting, I don't think you can punish, 
you know, everybody wants to hit it further and they found a way to physically move their body way faster, way faster than before. You know, so now it's club head speed, you know, we were taught rhythm, rhythm, tempo, whatever you want to call it, smooth and keep it all in control and balance. Now it's how can I thrash the thing at 100% and keep it in play and the equipment's done that, the head's this big, the shafts are, there's more, I was told years ago, there's more science in a gold shaft than there is in a blooming rocket, you know? So, yeah, what, uh... whatever. Uh, so, you know, you put all of that together, I, you can't blame the guys because they're, they're, they're physically and technically excellent. They can hit it a mile through the air. So I would love it to just be more difficult to do that because in my day, there was a 10 great drivers of the golf ball. And in modern times now, I know it's 30 years on, but there's 10 bad drivers. It's completely done the switch. You know, there's, there's the 350 club now. It used to be to get it to 300. Now it's went to the 300 through the air. Then it's gone to 320 through the air club. Now it's the 350 club. Who can get it 350 through the air? So um, I can't. And then just one more, more, you know, we had a great example of what Bernard Langer did at the Masters last year. So if Bernard was hitting three woods into, into the fifth hole when Bryce and his guys hit an A time, but if they rolled the ball back 20, percent he wouldn't play so i can't play it i guess you can't play the golf course so that's why it's not just as simple as uh hank anchoring the golf ball <laughs> putting a lead weight in it um i want i want to bring back striking so you you, you that's so basically the driver size and that sort of thing and you know i started off for fun saying well if they weren't if you weren't allowed a tee peg how good have you got to be to hit? A, that's a real skill. It's still a skill to hit a driver off the deck, isn't it? We all go nuts when somebody does it on a par five or whatever. So why, if we said, well, no tees, then you've got, well, Thursday, easy. Sunday, when you've hit one a bit thin and a bit fat, trying to win a tournament, hitting it driver off the deck, or it will be, it would be a new kind of driver. It would be probably the size of a pizza, you know, <laughs> to get all different face, you know, whatever. And then I come to some sense, well, if we only allowed a very short tee peg, you know, one inch max, seven eighths of an inch max. Well, because they can tee it up three inches. That's how the modern driver can be used. You know, you can take, Bryson's got some of them at four degrees. Four, and because you're hitting it on the up, five, and then actually you can still launch it at 14 degrees launch. Well, you wouldn't better do that if you were on a one up, a tiny little tee peg. So silly, little, maybe silly little things like that. I would love size of the driver face. Just bring back the quality of the strike. We can't stop the guys hitting it 300 plus, and they can do that physically probably with anything. Probably with anything, they get it over, over 300 now. But um, uh, boy, is that a long answer? So you know, I've 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 actually been briefing um, again my architects in a way that okay, if we have a whole, do we have another angle in a fairway? So if if the pros can hit it down there 350. Well, then it's still a really difficult, there's another kink or another angle which makes it A, difficult to hit the fairway and, it, and a difficult angle to the green just because they've cut it down to 80 yards, 100 yards from the green. So it's, um, yeah, we, bottom line, we're looking at it all the time. Um, just putting positional bunkers out there, that's why bunkers now have to run from, I said, you might as well start running bunkers. If you want to protect the side of the hole, bunkers might as well start at 260 and go to 360. You know, not necessarily to carry, but just to add equal, equal um, uh, accuracy. If somebody's hitting it 260 down. So that was the problem. When, it, we, when we suddenly hit and started hitting it longer, all these beautiful bunkers out there, 240, 260, which we drove in between, and suddenly they went going over, and the fair with the other side of the bunker was 60 yards wide. So that's when it, it did start a long time ago. Um, uh, so yeah, it's 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 either a major problem, or some people say hey, we love it because it's fun seeing the guy going for a par five now. That's it caused a lot of stir in our game, which is good good for golf. Fascinating. Uh, just changing tack slightly, uh, 
given golf's natural social distancing and the health benefits, golf has seen a good spike in mm. the number of new players uh, since the COVID pandemic. To keep them in the game and to, I guess, start yeah. attracting more millennials, should we be looking at more innovative forms of the game? Three and six hole courses, cutting well, the yeah. cut. Uh, absolutely, 100% everything. You know, I, I've now partnered with Golfway, or be fellow to Golfway, which is basically, you know, young equipment to get you started. Um, you know, big plastic heads. I mean, and I remember before the, the, the plastic clubs were, let's, let's call them toys, you know, had a plastic shaft full of air, that sort of thing. Now we have a real shaft in it. The, the club's actually swing weighted, even though it's got a plastic head. And then we've got instructional programs and that sort of thing. So that's something I'm, we at uh, Faldo Series will be promoting, bringing out as much as possible. You know, the Faldo Series is now just aligned with, with the Hurricane Tour, but now the Faldo Hurricane Series, we've created another 24 events in America. You know, the Faldo Series is now up to, um, well, we're going to be over 60. We'll be pretty close to 64 events. Uh, I was just talking to my son, Matthew, the other week. Uh, we're progressing well in South America. We will probably produce another, maybe 22. We'll have a dozen events in South America. So the series, Faldo series, so we created that opportunity, but really, really doing better than ticking the box for grassroots. Um, I think we've got some really cool ideas to, some, to bring fun to golf, uh, and it's still going to be educational as well. And you will progress through that from starting with fun clubs you know, plastic clubs, but I just proved it. Yeah, I did a little piece the other week. I, I played this with just with um, with uh, DJ, our Masters champion, and with a couple of young kids from his tournament. And, uh, you know, we had fun. That's the whole point of it. It was fun and it was not as, not as, not as easy as you think. And so it requires some skills and that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, we're trying our best to do that. I uh, 100% agree. And again, we've had up our sleeve um, design ideas, you know, par three courses. I'm a huge fan of par three courses because, again, it has a bad stigma. That, you know, it's easy. I can make a par three course, as you know, that you either, you either shoot nine under <laughs> or you're going to shoot three over. I mean, we can make a par three course, which is would be off the absolute charts. Um, we could also make it fun. We climb in rope bridges to get to the greens. I mean, that's, you know, we've had all these ideas. Uh, we've got to break down the barrier. The other very important thing is to break down because we're just trying to do a project right now, which is we were short of land. So we came up with a 12 hole golf course and a nine hole par three course. And of course, the dreaded, oh, we want a championship course comes in. We want 18 holes championship golf. And it's not going to be a championship golf course. It's just going to be a very nice golf course. But we're still stuck with that, how people think of, you know, around hotels. We had a project that was in, um, in Bermuda years ago, and it was like, we can do a fantastic 12 holes, but they won 18. And so, you know, and so we've been fighting this for a long time. And unfortunately, the RNA and everybody, you know, is now saying, hey, for fun, Go and play nine. It, and I love that. Um, I do that because, you know, we've got a life as well. We've got dogs. You don't even want to leave the dogs for five hours. Um, so I love to go down hit balls and play nine holes. That's, that's, that's plenty. It's, it's fun. So I'm a huge fan of bringing this back and doing it officially. I want to do a 12-hole golf course. I mean, we can go back to, you know, the Open started with 12 holes, didn't they? The muscle burst. So why not? Hey, we've got, we've got great history. And that's plenty, and it, and it doesn't mean it's going to be easy and a piece of pushover. Again, it could either be a pushover, which it needs to be, or it can be a brew. It could be an absolute brew. So it could be real. So, uh, and I've even, I've even got designs, um, you know, like we can build a great, in 35 acres, we can do a full-size driving range, and then you put nine-hole par three course around the outside of it, and obviously you could then use off the off the towers of the driving range, you can that can all be floodlit, so it's not a mess. So it looks nice and neat, and you've got something you could practice. The par threes could be played both directions, which is kind of cool. That's another kind of brief I've always been giving my guys. 
hey, let's, let's build golf courses where we could turn around and go the other way. I'm still dying to do that at St. Andrews. Um, all sorts of fun things like that. So you just need a couple of uh, adventurous owners to go, yeah, let's go with it. Because I think you get unbelievable publicity if you did something. It's, let's say that we want to build a golf course purely for people's enjoyment, entertainment, fun. And, and, and to encourage people to come out there and say, hey, it's not, it's not a brute to go and play golf. Yeah. You know, hit it. I, I want to build a golf course, you can just top it along the ground and you can still be able to play it. Not that I advise that. I do advise, <laughs> not I do advise, get some lessons, get it airborne. It's a, that's another one of our arguments is, you know, I think you shouldn't really be going on the golf course until you can get it airborne. And you're not topping it and you're not shanking it. So I, I'm a strong, but you know, because you enjoy it. And that's what we we're talking about. The sustainability, our game is difficult. It is very difficult. And so you've got to break the ice to get the ball airborne. And um, once you've got that, you're kind of hooked. Once you've whacked one down the range, my, my young daughter, she would do that. She'd run down the range after the ball and you'd go, well, how about that? That's what this game does. Um, but there's kids, unfortunately, today, you know, this thing. If they haven't got an answer in five seconds, I can't do that. You know, this just doesn't, doesn't work. And they, and the other great line is, you know, I can do it. And you say, let me help. No, I can do this. And they tee a ball up and they go, <laughs> and they go, oh, they don't work. I go, yeah, funny that. So, so that's the other problem is the discipline. I was taught, unbeknown to me, the discipline of golf. You know, my first lesson was the grip. Second lesson was posture. Third lesson, alignment. Fourth lesson, start moving. I hit, them, I hit the ball finally on my fourth lesson. If, you, if a kid's not hitting the ball in four seconds, so that's another thing. That's one of the tricky things we have to teach in our game is that, and it's good for you, learning a bit of discipline, um, which, as you know, in kids, it's got to be taught without them realizing they're being taught. You know, it's got to be, that's why I'm back to, if we can, come up with some fun ideas where kids are doing golf and think wow this is cool and they're getting a clue um because we understand so much more just to touch on the physical side as well because we know the body rotation is difficult for golf to learning to throw your weight one way and the other way and not look like a silly twizzle um again they got good physical programs to help kids learn golf which would be pretty darn good for them rather than sitting on their phones or computers to actually get out and swing their arms around. So, um, but you're right, COVID was actually wonderful for us. COVID, as you said, yeah, I mean, I, I believe in many places, green fee, uh, you know, just golf course rounds was up 20%. Yeah. Uh, you know, I know, in a, I know in America, you know, this golf pass, they booked 16 million tee times before and last year they booked 26 million. Wow. Tea times. So, yeah, we've lucked out. Golf, being an outdoor sport, very, very good. We just can't knock it. Can't understand why the politicians don't make a meal out of it. If, if necessary, play a one ball. I mean, I see, I'm sure there's a lot of people in Ireland. Would be, if the bottom line was you can only play a one ball, they would do it. You bowl up in your car, you walk to the tee, you go and play and come back. You haven't been near anybody. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm annoyed for the golfers that the restrictions have been so harsh that you can't get out on open land in the fresh air or even go and walk a beach. We had that in Florida. Can't walk the beach. <laughs> you know, when it's blowing, it's blowing 40 miles an hour. I don't think COVID can get airborne. So, you know, very frustrating, you know. Uh, fantastic to hear your thoughts on that. On the theme of innovation, the Faldo course at the Emirates Golf Club in Dubai was in the spotlight late last yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. I think the Moonlight Classic on the Ladies European Tour. Now, when you redesigned that course in 2005, I think, was night golf an integral part of the design plans there? I wouldn't say part of the design. Yeah, I, I believe it was talked about right off the bat yes they were going to put it was going to be floodlit um and then i heard yes i heard it was the most popular golf yeah. course in dubai region because it was doing fifty five thousand rounds because people could obviously in the summer then when it's 50 degrees you know 130 degrees um 
um, people could go out at night and play, which you know, I still haven't done. I still would love to do it. And so uh, maybe when I swing by Dubai this year, I should I should go and do it because uh, it sounds fun. Uh, visually, you know, the balls are arranged and love it because you see the flight forever. Probably very good for us now we're losing our eyesight as we get older You see the darn thing glow. <laughs> so, um, um, yeah, I they done a good job on that. That was great to create that. And I think I, I see no reason why the men couldn't play. Again, an exhibition done at night with fancy colors and lasers or what have you would be actually, again, good for our sport to show uh, a bit of in, you know a bit of entertainment fabulous we we have one final question for you that's come in uh, from one of our members a uh, nice one to finish with can you tell us your favorite holes at augusta national st andrews and muir oh. the venues where you won your six majors all right let's see what i like what i really um <laughs> so augusta obviously um I like the I like the first Augusta because I think that really makes you think, you know, because it is a, it's beautiful. You're right next to the clubhouse, the whole atmosphere. That's a very important part of design. Create a lovely rhythm around the clubhouse, and then off you go. So one obviously is great. Um, I love the sixth hole. That was very, especially that, you know, that back right hole location is really a that's your barometer of how good your iron shots are. Yeah, it's in practice rounds, let alone tournament play. If you're good enough, even in practice rounds to hit it up there, you get a good indication. I can, I can hit it where I intend. Obviously, eleventh, yeah, white dogwood is my yep. famousest. Yep. Nobody, nobody will ever win two Masters <laughs> on the eleventh hole in a playoff ever, 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 because they don't play it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> they play ten and eighteen. No, so you know that's that's. For me to have a hole like that in my mind or when I visit it is very emotional. Um, and, you know, so those ones are key. Obviously, 12 is famous as well in your in your eyes. Um, and then moving to Muirfield of how tough it can play. Gosh, that fourth hole, the par three is a brute. And then you play six, seven, and eight is another very, very difficult, twisty, turny corner to the golf course. Um, obviously, and my finish, you know, that famous finish in 92, it's in my mind, you know, I, I, did, I did hit three of the best iron shots of my life. A five iron on the 15, the four iron on 17, and the three iron on 18, I still regard as the three best with those particular clubs, the best shots ever hit with them. So it's nice to have that kind of memory in my, in my, uh, in my mind. And, um, and St. Andrews, well, you know, St. Andrews has got so many, it, it, the view, the views of what gets you most. I think when you start walking in down 14, obviously 14 is one of the great, greatest power fives because of all so many options. Because we, again, in our day, we used to go left, hard left down the fifth fairway to get an angle around that big giant mound, front right. So, um, so obviously that one, you know, 17 and 18 are a brute. 17, obviously, 18 is so historic. So, um, God, that's easy to pick. And I love the 11th, uh, the 10th, that's the 11th hole, yeah, par three. Um, because again, that can play it. anything from an eight iron to a four iron. Um, so that's that's a quick, quick guided tour of, of some of those holes that I love. Yeah. Fantastic. A lovely note to end on. We thank you very, very much, Sir Nick, for your time and your fascinating thoughts. We hope there are some course developers and owners who are listening into this and like the idea of 12 old courses and yeah, yeah, which we desperately need in Asia and around the world for golf. So yeah. we hope also to see you back here in November at the Faldo Series Asia final at Lanco and um, <laughs> Uh, to, to having you back with us on the AGIF Sustainability Series. 
Sure, my pleasure. Thank you all. Many thanks, Nick. All the best. Sure, cheers, cheers. Cheers. I think uh, you would all agree that, that uh, Sir Nick is one of the best interviews of all time. And I'd like to congratulate Spencer for doing such a good job with him. Um, we had Sir Nick and also Fanny Sennison, his caddy, uh, on those interviews. And, and we, they spent two hours with us, which is really generous of their time and really a great indication of uh, the love of game that they, they hold. So uh, thank you very much to Sir Nick. Uh, again, and we have two uh, individuals who were key in being able to uh, um, uh, being able to bring Sir Nick to us. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Mark Adams of Faldo Design and Adam Calver of Laguna Lanco Resort, uh, Sir Nick Faldo Signature Design in Hawaii, Vietnam. And they're here with us today to answer a few questions. Before that, I'd like to give them a few uh, a little bit of background for each individual. Background on Mark uh, is having spent 25 years in golf and sports marketing industry in, in Asia. Mark has developed an extensive network of business relationships at all levels across the entire region and his experience in developing revenues and developing implementing profitable sports and entertainment properties in Asia. Priority, prior to joining Follow Design, Mark spent 23 years at IMG, including 18 years directing IMG's golf course services divisions which provided design, construction management, and club management services throughout the Asia Pacific region. Under his direction, the team at IMG was involved in over 100 golf course projects in the region. And during this time, Mark worked closely with high profile golf clients to establish and or expand their design business in Asia, including Sir Nick, Ernie Els, Gary Player, Annika Sorensen, Colin Montgomery, Sergio, Sergio Garcia, and many others. Um, having joined IMG in 1993 in Jakarta, Mark launched and created IMG's operations in Indonesia, including event management and sponsored sales of many high profile events in many different sports, such as badminton, golf, basketball, and soccer and tennis. Originally from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Mark does holds a bachelor in economics from Rollins College in Florida and an MBA from the Thunderbird School of International Management in Arizona, a very fine school. Adam, Adam's background, Adam's career highlights, uh, Adam has a bachelor in applied science majoring in golf course management. Did some career highlights, 18 years in the golf industry, 14 years in management and nine years of executive experience. De delivered uh, four top uh, world top 100 golf courses in three different countries over the past nine years and led and directed motivated team that delivered Canada's number one and number two public golf courses. Uh, elevated Nirwana Bali Golf Club to its two best financial years and highest world ranking. Uh, hosted the 2009 Dubai World Championship at Jumara uh, Golf Estates. He assisted in the golf prepara course preparation for the 2009 British Open at Turnbury and hosted the 2002 G8 Summit at Kanaskis Golf Club, golf course in uh, Canada. Uh, a little bit of career history. Uh, Adam started as the su uh, assistant superintendent uh, in the Olympic View Golf Club from 2006 to 2007. He was a golf course superintendent on the fire course at Jeremiah Golf Estates from 2007 to 2010, and is director of agronomy to, uh, at Nirwana Bali Golf Club from 2012 to 13. And uh, before joining um, Gunalanko, he was uh, vice president of golf at Cabot Links and Cabot Cliffs in Canada. So still a very relatively young man. So. Thank you, gentlemen, for spending some time with us and, and, and sharing some expertise. Uh, we do have a few questions uh, to, to refer to. Uh, first one is coming from uh, Vincent. And Vincent is asking if there's any plans uh, to have any golf course designs in India. And Mark, maybe that's an intro to what uh, Faldo's developments has been recently and uh, your plans in the future. Yeah, well, um, thanks for the question. We would love to do something in India. Um, you know, Faldo Design did have a contract going back many years, probably 10 years ago now, at a major project development that was planned uh, near Mumbai, just south of Mumbai. Unfortunately, that project did not go ahead. So Sir Nick is still looking for the first opportunity to complete a design in India. Um, we know that, um, you know, I know from the experience there that um, land acquisition can be challenging in India. And I think as you just heard Nick talk about, you know, his uh, interest in doing maybe par three short courses, different forms of golf, 
you know, we'd be very interested if there are opportunities there, even if it's not a full 18 holes. Um, I know in India, there's been a, a number of uh, parcels of land that have been developed as part of real estate projects that maybe it's not a full 18 holes. So if, um, yeah, if there are any opportunities to do a full 18 holes, we'd be interested. If there's an opportunity to do other forms of golf, as Nick mentioned, we'd be very interested. We have, you know, over the past few years, we've had a few contacts, a few discussions, but um, yeah, we haven't found the right opportunity yet, but we're very interested. Um, Adam, I have a question for you and also Mark. You know, you worked with quite a few designers over the years uh, in various different places. Uh, what do you think defines uh, Sir Nick's design philosophy uh, as it compares to maybe some others that you've worked with? Uh, well, from, from my side, we've spent, um, you know, almost a dozen days over the last four years walking around the course. And obviously Nick brings a lot of course strategy to the, to the table with his insight. Um, I'm very lucky that he's, you know, gave us the time each uh, time he's been in Vietnam to come and personally spend a lot of time looking at uh, greens and how they function, shade issues, pin positions. Um, so he usually walks the course before each Faldo series. And we discuss a lot of the challenges with the design as we start to increase green speed on the greens and limited pin location. So yeah, uh, Nick's been very insightful with us and we've done a lot of upgrades uh, over the last four years here at Laguna and we, we continue to do so. Um, part of our 19th hole philosophy is that now gives us the opportunity to, to look at either softening or uh, steepening some of the existing greens over the next couple of years. Great. And Mark, same question. Uh, you know, you work with a lot of designers as listed in your experience in bio. Uh, what do you think defines Sir Nick uh, in comparison well, to I, Yeah, I think, as you said, I have worked with a number of different, um, you know, golfers have gotten into the design game. And I think you know, a lot of them are very hands-on, but Nick, you know, without, but there are also others that, um, you know, it is, I, I, you know, there are some that maybe are not as involved as you would like. And Nick is very hands-on. Um, you know, he gets involved at a very early stage. He works very closely with our design team, uh, Andy Hagar, Gareth Williams, who are based in our design office. You know, they're in constant communication with him. And I think the other thing that sort of sets him apart, um, he mentioned it a bit in his interview, he, you know, his ability to visualize, uh, it's not easy to go out onto a golf course site when it's you know, dirt, he called it mud, but you know, when you're, when you're out there and you're looking at dirt and um, you're trying to see bunkers that are, you're standing on a, you know, a tee and you're trying to see turning points, you're trying to see bunkers, you're trying to visualize holes. Um, he's very good at that. And um, I've always, I've been impressed with how he can go out there on the site and pick it up uh, and actually can see, you know, see the, see the holes very easily. So he, He's very good at visual, visualization. Um, the other thing is that he, you know, he likes adventure. He likes to travel. You know, he talked about, you know, his example on, at Laguna Lanco. We have, um, you know, we have a new project in Pakistan. He had no, no hesitation traveling to Pakistan. He likes, you know, he likes traveling to exotic places. Um, he likes traveling the world. And, um, you know, in my job in trying to find opportunities for Nick, um, if we find the right developer, we find the right site, we find the right opportunity, um, he's game to, um, you know, to get involved. Um, Adam, you know, you're, you're probably one of the few people in worldwide who's been able to uh, live a, a semi-normal existence. Every time I talk to you, you're, you're flying from one place to another. And there's a lot of, you know, Vietnam is one of the, the, the hottest growth opportunities. Uh, and I know Faldo's involved, but I, can you give us a little bit of overview of the, of the growth of the game in Vietnam and, and what you feel is, is really coming forward there? Yeah, obviously, um, we've been very lucky here in Vietnam that the, um, managed to contain any outbreaks over the last almost a uh, year and a half now. So domestic travel has been, you know, um, disrupted for one or two months, but overall we've been able to, to get around the country and, and play some golf. And also there's a lot of new projects that have continued on throughout the, uh, the pandemic with, uh, with very little disruption. So um, Vietnam's obviously got, uh, you know, 300 kilometers of beautiful coastline. They've got sand dunes, they've got mountains, they've got jungles. So, there's a lot of interesting landscapes that are being used for golf right now. Uh, there's probably around six different courses that are going to open in Vietnam in the next few months. Um, so that'll be uh, obviously a big push once borders open for international travel to come see courses that just weren't available um, before things closed down. Um, you know, um, Fall the Design's got a few products that are one pencil to open up in a couple months, which will be pretty exciting. And hopefully a few other ones get started by the end of the year. Um, but yeah, we've been pretty fortunate in Vietnam to 
see golf obviously growing as well just domestically where when things first closed down we weren't sure how much of a, a domestic uh, market there would be but uh, the city courses have seen substantial growth and uh, the last two months we're seeing resort courses starting to pick up and uh, some of our numbers getting close to uh, pre-COVID numbers for rounds of golf which is good. I think uh, overall, uh, wherever you are, whether you're free to travel or not, the the the, num the, the frequency of golf has increased uh, globally, and certainly in Asia, that's a feedback that we'd like to be uh, providing more information in, in the future about. It's a good news story for golf. Um, Mark, um, you know, you are not able to travel so much. I mean, are you, I know you are traveling from the U.S. and now you're in Singapore for a period of time. But uh, have you? What have you felt the the change in the design business and how you manage? you know, projects. I know you still manage to keep a fairly strong pipeline, which is great news, but uh, how do you see the difference in, in using Zoom calls, et cetera, and other things to, to manage your uh, project maintenance, so to speak? Yeah, we've been fortunate at Founder Design that, you know, the projects that we had signed pre-COVID um, for the most part have continued. Um, we have a project in Pakistan, which is um, continued on throughout COVID, which we're now completing grassing. And uh, we expect that to be finished in the next couple of months in terms of the, the grassing. Uh, as Adam mentioned, we have another project called Tanlan Golf Club near Hanoi, which uh, recently has completed grassing and should open for play in June. We have another one near Ho Chi Minh City in Long An, where they have uh, continued construction. Uh, we, and we have a few other projects where we've completed the design process during COVID. Uh, it's been challenging because I think, especially when you get into construction, the key, uh, you know, a lot of the key to success is the changes and the, you know, the, the, the approvals, the changes, just the, the fine details that you're able to tweak in the field. And normally on a typical project, you know, our, our design team would make upward of 20 visits to a site over, you know, an 18 or 24 month period. So pretty much every month we would be on site uh, approving different aspects of the design and the construction. So that we've really had to change, you know, that that process um, totally in terms of how we do the designs. Uh, one of our, um, sorry, I just had another call coming in, which uh, threw my screen off. But um, so our, our guys, I mean, what we've done, luckily our clients have, you know, in our, our client in Pakistan, our client in Vietnam, we've, we, they've worked very well. We were fortunate enough in Vietnam that we had a very good team, a project team on, on site that remained in Vietnam throughout, a project manager, shapers. And it's been a lot about communication. It's been videos, it's been photos, it's been Zoom calls, as you mentioned. You know, our, our current project in Vietnam, we've, we've got, you know, detailed mapping going on of the green complexes that uh, are going back and forth just to make sure that the shapes of the greens are matching. We're getting pictures of uh, sent to us of bunkers, and then our design team are taking those pictures and marking them up and sending back. So it's been challenging, but um, you know we're we're trying we're trying to manage the best we can. And I think, and I think we're doing a pretty good job in terms of uh, what we can do during this period. This is sort of a leading question, uh, you know, as as you're both uh, Mark, you're a former board member, and Adam, you're a current board member. You know that the AGIF really focuses on. Uh, groundskeeping, greenskeeping, and the turf maintenance side of the business uh, as a primary uh, concern. We offer the certificate of greenskeeping in conjunction with the, the RNA and several partners. Um, given that both of you have uh, seen the evolution of golf courses in many formats from the build to the completion to the running for three or four or five years or even 10 years, how important is the, the I mean, it's an obvious question, but it's a vital question for maintenance of the golf course to maintain the brand, the ongoing brand and legacy of the designer uh, within this context. And, and how many times is it really considered by the owner uh, in your experience after the first initial big amount of money is spent? Um, yeah, I guess, you know, from my side, I, I started my career learning how to maintain a golf course and then learning how to build them and then run them from the business side. Um, a, a good superintendent or some strong agronomic programs can overcome a lot of construction shortcomings, but uh, perfect construction um, doesn't make up for a lack of experience or um, proper agronomic programs. And typically that first three to five years of being operational, um, 
that's crucial for the, the long-term sustainability of the club. Um, if you're most clubs, you will open up probably before you're finished construction to start getting some revenue in and to, to get some kind of preview play or construction play. Um, but getting that, that finishing touch, uh, most of the designers get the course um, 70, maybe 80%, and then it's up to the, the, the maintenance teams to finish up the detail work and to help it mature over the first couple of years. So yeah, we're seeing a bigger demand, especially in Vietnam right now for more, more education and more experience because it is a, a hyper growth market. Um, sometimes you're promoted just because you've, you've, you've been there the longest, maybe you're not the most, um, most experienced or, or qualified. So we are working on that to try to make sure we get more opportunities for education, get things translated, but definitely crucial in those first few years to make sure that you've set the foundation for the club and, and kind of built that reputation. I've, I've always, when I've, when I've spoke, spoken with developers in the past, I've, I've always said, I think there's three key item, three key pillars to a successful golf course. You, you know, you must have a good design. You must have quality construction. You must have good golf course maintenance. And if any three of those are lacking, I think, you know, you could have a subpar golf course. So, you know, for, as a golf course design company, you know, we really only have control of maybe the first two. We're obviously, we're, we're providing the design, and there are many great golf course design companies out there that are doing good designs. We stay involved through construction, um, so we can provide our inputs. But, you know, most of the time when the golf course, when the grassing is completed, you know, we are out of there, and um, we have very little influence over the golf course maintenance. Now, we do have in our agreement that if design changes are made to the golf course, or if the, the golf course is not maintain to a, a certain standard, you know, we do have the, op, you know, the opportunity or the option to remove, you know, the founder design name, but that's, you know, that's very rare. So, you know, golf course, as, as Adam said, you know, um, good golf course maintenance could overcome or, you know, a lesser quality construction, but, um, you know, golf course maintenance is key. And I think what AGIF is doing in terms of the training uh, is important. And I think it's also important that, um, you know, we get more local superintendents um, qualified. Um, I think, you know, 25, 30 years ago when Southeast Asia, when you saw, you know, the first big boom in golf courses in, in you know, places like Philippines and Thailand and Malaysia and Singapore, a lot of them brought in, you know, expat superintendents. But I think the trend has been over the years, and I think this is a necessary trend and it's the only way to make it sustainable is that, and I, and I think we're seeing it now. If you look at look at Singapore, you look at Malaysia, I think it's starting to happen in Vietnam. Um, the new course that we're opening near Hanoi, they have a Vietnamese superintendent. So the key to make this industry sustainable is, you know, is, you know, local uh, knowledge and local superintendents. So I commend the AGIF for what you're doing in, the, in these areas. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, on that strong note, I think, uh, you know, we've taken enough of your time I uh, really appreciate, uh, again, um, uh, working with Sir Nick to get him on uh, with the AGI platform. It's greatly appreciated by all our members and uh, non-members who are looking at this. This will be posted on the uh, AGIF YouTube channel, uh, along with all our other uh, turf grass management and club management videos, uh, which we run on a weekly basis. Uh, next week, just uh, while I have you on the line, we, uh, we have Dr. Kevin Kenworthy, professor of turf grass breeding and genetics from the University of Florida. And he'll be talking about improvement of zoysia grass and Bermuda for use on golf courses. So a topic that is, we just addressed in the importance uh, all about grass and the maintenance of the grass. So on behalf of the AGIF, Mark and Adam, thank you so much. Obviously a shout out to Sir Nick uh, as well. Uh, we greatly appreciate your, uh, your assistance. And to all uh, our viewers out there, Thanks for uh, spending some time with us. Uh, have a great rest of the week and a great weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. See you. Bye. Bye-bye.